So this video will introduce the combinatorics of 0, 1 matrices with specified row and column sums and its relationship to symmetric polynomials. So we're going to let z2 m mu lambda, where mu and lambda are integer partitions of n, be the number of 0, 1 matrices, so matrices with entries either 0 or 1, that has row sum mu and column sum lambda. So here I have written down the two possible 0, 1 matrices with row sum 2, 1, 1. So if you add the rows, you get 2, 1, 1. And column sum 2, 2. So if you add the columns, you get 2, 2. So it turns out there's only two ways to do a row sum 2, 1, 1 and column sum 2, 2, 0, 1 matrix. So this number is 2. And in this table, I've recorded the values of all possible numbers of 0, 1 matrices for all integer partitions mu and lambda of 4. There are a lot of zeros in this matrix. For example, the 3, 1, 2, 2 entry is 0 because there's no way to have a 0, 1 matrix with row sum 3, 1 and column sum 2, 2. You only have two columns, so you don't have three places to put ones, for example. This entry here is 2 because we have these two matrices. Okay, so that is this notation. Now I'm going to relate the number of 0, 1 matrices to the elementary symmetric polynomials. So what were the elementary symmetric polynomials? Well, recall that for any integer partition mu, E mu is a polynomial in a number of variables defined to be the sum over all row increasing t, where you sum the weight of t. I'm going to make two observations about these elementary symmetric polynomials. So observation one. So let's suppose we let, so if we let the elementary symmetric polynomial E n, so that's the elementary symmetric polynomial of 4 or something like that, say. If I don't want to keep writing the parentheses down, so I denote this by just E subscript n. Then this elementary symmetric polynomial E n, x1 through x n, capital N, is something that might look like this. So x1 times x2 times x little n plus x1 x2 x little n minus 1, x n plus 1, and more terms, maybe another term could be x2 through x n plus 1. The thing that I'm trying to point out is because each one of these terms in the elementary symmetric polynomial comes from a row increasing tableau t, like 1, 2, 3, up to n, the subscripts, the subscripts listed here have to all be different. So these all have different subscripts. No two, like you could never have a squared, x1 squared term in any of the elementary symmetric polynomial en. So that's observation one. Observation two is that e of an integer partition mu, mu1, mu2, and so on, is simply e mu1 times e mu2, and so on. To show you what I mean with observation 2 in an example, if I had e of the integer partition 5, 3, 3, then this would be the elementary symmetric function e5 times e3 times e3. This is only because when you write down what the elementary symmetric polynomial E533 is, it's the sum over all weights of row increasing fillings of the shape 533. So you could fill in the rows 
as long as the numbers increase within the rows. However, one row will not affect the choices for another. The fillings of each row are independent of one another. So 1, 3, 7, and then 2, 4, 6. The fillings in one row are independent from the fillings in another. And so that's why this equation is, is true. Okay, so those are my two observations. And here is the main theorem that I'm trying to get to in this video. R relates the elementary symmetric polynomials and these 0, 1 matrices. So the theorem is the coefficient of the monomial symmetric function m lambda in the elementary symmetric function e mu is this number z2m of mu lambda. So I don't think I'm going to prove this theorem formally. I think I'm going to just do an example. And through the example, I think it will be absolutely clear of why the theorem is true. So check this out. Let's find the coefficient of the monomial symmetric function. How about we try 3, 3, 2, 2, 1. So there's my integer partition. In the elementary symmetric polynomial E533. Three, three. Now E533, three, three, as we observed right here in observation 2, is E5 times E3 times E3. Now, using the observation number 1, E5 is the sum over all monomials that look like x1 x2, x3, x4, x5. So I have five terms, all with different subscripts. So maybe I can have x1, x2, x3, x4, x6. Any choice of five different subscripts I will have when writing down E5. And similarly for E3, except I pick three subscripts and multiply those powers together. And then another E3, so x1, x2, x3 and so on. If I care about the coefficient of the monomial symmetric function 3, 3, 2, 2, 1, then we examine the coefficient of x to the third, x1 to the third, x2 to the third, x3 squared, x4 squared, and x5, See, the monomial symmetric function is the sum over all monomials of this form, where the exponents are the integer partition, 3, 3, 2, 2, 1. So I, I want to somehow get the coefficient of this term in the product of E5, E3, E3. So I want to multiply these three parentheses together and somehow get this term out. Now, when you multiply parentheses together, it corresponds to choosing one term in each of the parentheses to multiply. And I'm going to organize my choices with a table. So considering this table, watch this. So I'm going to put E5, E3, and E3 along the rows of a table. And along the columns of the table, I'm going to list x1 to the third, x2 to the third, x3 squared, x4 squared, and x5 to the first. So, for example, I need to get this monomial out. So I'm going to choose to multiply this first term in the first parentheses with terms in the second and the third parentheses. When I select this term, I'm going to indicate my selection by writing a 1 in each one of these columns. From the, x, from the middle parentheses here corresponding to x3, I'm going to select three subscripts. I want to get three subscripts, so I'm going to indicate my choice this way. 
So one, one, zero, one, zero. The ones are gonna indicate that I'm taking that subscript. So I put a one here, meaning I'm gonna take an X1. I put a one here, so X1. So this corresponds to taking the X1, X2, X4 term from the middle sum. And then from the last sum, I'm gonna pick X1, X2, X3, this term. And I'm not gonna pick an X4 or X5. So if I multiply this term times this term times this term together, I do indeed get the correct monomial. What I've really done is just recorded my choices of multiplication with ones and zeros in a matrix. And it, the way that I've organized it makes sure that the row sum is five, three, three, and the column sum is three, three, two, two, one. So I think that's all I'm going to say about the proof of the theorem, except that this works in general. So if you like the coefficient of m lambda in e mu, you put your elementary symmetric polynomials here, you get your target monomial here, and you just fill out ones and zeros. A one means you take a monomial from that parentheses, and a zero means you don't. Okay, so that's a nice theorem. If I look at this table up here, I can use it to do interesting expressions. So, for example, E22. E22 is a sum of monomial symmetric polynomials. E22, if I look at this table, I'm going to look at the 2-2 two, two column here. I'm going to look at the 2-2 two, two column. And this says that E22 is one copy of M22 plus two copies of M211 and six copies of M1 four times. So this table, because of the theorem, gives us a way to take any elementary symmetric polynomial and write it as a sum of monomial symmetric polynomials. So this table really gives the, the coefficients that you're looking for, 1, 2, 6 in this example. And as a corollary to this observation, this is a good corollary. I think it's technically known as the fundamental theorem of symmetric polynomials, but that's way too fancy for what it really is. So the corollary is the elementary symmetric polynomials E lambda where lambda ranges over all integer partitions of n is a basis for the vector space lambda n. Remember, that's the vector space of all degree n symmetric polynomials. So why? Why does this corollary follow from the theorem? Well, if you recall, the monomial symmetric polynomials are a basis for this vector space, and that implies the dimension of this vector space is the number of integer partitions of n. So this set actually gives me the correct number of integer partitions of n, I mean, the correct number of basis vectors. So the dimension's correct, but are these vectors linearly independent? Is E lambda 1 and lambda 2 linearly independent? Well, if you look at this matrix, you'll notice that it's not quite triangular. Triangular technically means that you have a triangle in the bottom left corner or the upper right corner. This is like a backwards triangular matrix, but nevertheless, you'll notice that um, the determinant of this matrix is non-zero. It's non-zero. This matrix has a lot of zeros in it because there's oftentimes not a single way to form such a matrix that we care about. Because this matrix is invertible, that means that the E lambdas uh, can be shown to be linearly independent because you express them as monomial symmetric polynomials. For example, uh, the elementary symmetric polynomial E1 four times has the monomial symmetric function M4 in it, and no other elementary symmetric polynomial contains this, M4. 
So that means that has to be linearly independent from the rest. Similarly, since there's a one here and <laughs> zeros elsewhere, um, you can get linearly independent, show linear independence that way. Um, so what I'm trying to say in brief is that these are linearly independent because the matrix is invertible here. Um, why is the matrix invertible in general? Well, if the length of mu is larger than the maximum part of lambda, the entry in this matrix is zero. And so therefore, you get this lower semi-triangular kind of situation implying that the matrix is invertible and therefore this is a basis for the vector space. Okay, wonderful.